Today we're going to be talking about weight distribution on cars and this video is going to be specifically about front wheel drive weight distribution. I'm going to probably come up with some others about all wheel drive and rear wheel drive weight distribution. But this video was a video request from the runner up to the rebrand Kyle Drives competition, Ted Summer. And he basically wanted to know about the influence of weight distribution on front wheel drive cars. And so we basically came up with this joint idea. Now the first myth I should probably clear up before we get into this video is the concept of the ideal 50-50 weight distribution. Because in actual fact, 50-50 really isn't the ideal weight distribution for the majority of cases. And it's really quite simple to understand why. If we imagine that we're in a constant radius corner, then we are going to be driving around our corner. We're not taking any sort of acceleration or braking inputs. We don't have any yaw angle changes or something like that. Just constant corner. We're going to have a weight transfer from inside to outside. We're going to have even grip load on all of our um, tires front to back. So our outside tires will take more of the grip. The inside tires will take a little bit less of the grip because of the weight transfer. And so we'll end up with even grip allocation, assuming we have a 50-50 weight distribution. Now that means that that's all fine and dandy. We end up with our mass balance 50-50. We can size our tires 50-50 because everything's even and that's all great. Of course, the problem comes when you start to do a transient maneuver, okay? So let's say that in our example here of a front wheel drive car, we go to accelerate. Once we go to accelerate, our weight transfers off to our rear tires. That means that we have less than the car's mass pressing down on the front tires. Uh, so our front tire weight is less and so we end up with less available front grip, which inevitably causes understeer as you get on the throttle in a front wheel drive car. So it can be seen that really when we're accelerating in a front wheel drive car, we want weight over the front axle. And if you think about something like say a drag car here, if we are accelerating purely with a front wheel drive drag car, so all our tractive force comes from these front wheels, you can see that we want as much mass as possible over the front wheels to ensure as much weight as possible over them as we're accelerating. Theoretically, there's no reason you can't have 100% mass on the front axle, and that may you'd end up with maximum traction on the front axle. In fact, if you have 100% mass on the front axle, so your CG was sitting here, but let's say we actually got it to the ground, so it was sitting there, we'd end up with zero weight transfer and you'd accelerate like an all-wheel drive car. So theoretically, anyway, for acceleration, you'd want 100% weight distribution forwards. There becomes a slight problem though, because the second you start to brake, your center of gravity is of course not at the contact patch, it is somewhere up here. And so what happens is that as you brake, you decelerate, you get a force from the center of mass decelerating, you get a torque around the contact patch, and of course your car will try to flip itself. So even in something like a drag car, you can see that that's not ideal because if you don't have a chute to purely slow you down at the end of your uh, drag strip, you're going to flip your car the second you stamp on the brake. So we obviously can't have 100% on the front axle, but we do want it as forward as is feasible within stability regions. We also can't really get 100% on the front axle without ballasting it up because you do have the whole chassis and the rear axle going on here. So we've now established that theoretically for straight line acceleration, we want as much mass over the front wheels as possible and therefore as much weight on them. But when it comes to cornering, that's not quite the case. The first thing that we have to think about is our normal load sensitivity. Now, if you look at my older tighter videos, you'll know that for the more weight you add for a given contact patch size, the less efficient that tire is at carrying the grip. It's the normal load sensitivity. So if we now place our center of gravity heaps forward, so let's say we end up with something like a, a 75-25 split on our mass, what we end up with is if we were to match our contact patch sizes to our relative weights on the front and rear axles, we'd end up with this contact patch having to be three times larger than the contact patch here. So the net result of that is that these tires would have to be three times as wide as that if we're just manipulating contact patch through width. So we end up with our front wheel drive car up with really massive front tires and really tiny rear tires. And at first glance, that's actually all right. Uh, but the problem is, is that many different rules classes and of course practical limitations in terms of what you can actually fit in a wheel arch mean that you can't actually run uh, a tire that would be proportional because let's say you were running like a 205 tire on the rear, uh, you'd need to run 
three times that on the front, that would be a 600 or so millimeter wide tire. So it's, it's not really something that's gonna work. So if we went a 300 mil tire on the front, that would be a 100 mil tire on the rear, and then a 100 mil tire on the rear is then too narrow. Uh, you're going to get normal load conditions compromising anyway. So it's not practical, especially when you consider many categories mandate a maximum tire width. Well, Time Attack, for example, uh, mandates maximum tire width. And so if you're limited by the width of your front tires, and let's say you want to match efficiency uh, by matching your rear tires, you can see the problems with running super forward weight distributions. Of course, we can compensate for this by running a more similar tire all round, and then basically robbing grip off the rear to add to the front. Things like adding stiffer springs in the rear, stiffer anti-roll bars in the rear, playing around a li little bit with pressures to change the contact patch sizes, stuff like that can actually rob grip from the rear and give it to the front. So if you've got excessive grip uh, on the rear from having a wider tire, you can then actually use that so that the front doesn't have to work as hard. The other compromise you can see by moving this weight heaps forward and having to run a really massively wide front tire is that the front tire is actually much harder to control with your suspension. Uh, the rear tire only moves as a set number of degrees of freedom. It moves up in bump and you can generally design your suspension around that. The fronts also have to deal with steering. And this means that as you're dealing with steering, you've induced another degree of freedom. It's now much harder to design a suspension system that can cope with that correctly, especially when it comes to the balance of camber uh, on the front tires, which can cause you to have to compromise further on whether you want to go more for cornering performance or straight line performance. The final disadvantage of running a really forward center of gravity for your, your front wheel drive car is that under braking, you end up with very significant weight transfer to the front. Now, obviously you can negate this by having a center of gravity as low as possible. Lower center of gravity stops weight transfer. The, the problem is, is that if you've already got 75% of your weight on your front tires and you now hit braking, you could end up with something like 90% of your car's weight on your front tires, uh, or even higher than that if you're running this higher center of gravity forward. Um, and this means that higher weight transfer, higher normal load sensitivity changes, and that of course causes you to end up with less efficiency and less performance under braking. So we've now established that for cornering, we want to have the center of gravity more towards the middle of the car for steady state. For anything involving acceleration, we want to have the center of gravity towards the front. And so now we've got a compromise. And that's why I can't actually recommend you a specific center of gravity that is going to be correct for your front wheel drive car because everyone's going to have different things. Even different driving styles can change what you want. Um, somewhere between 70, 30 and 60, 40, Probably not bad guesses. I personally haven't set up a front wheel drive race car, but the numbers I have seen for people that have do lie around those margins. In reality, you're going to want to, to try and just cut as much weight as physically possible. And due to the location of the engine power plant, stuff like that, uh, it may inevitably force you into having quite a forward weight distribution. And as discussed earlier, from a traction perspective, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. You also have to consider your aero when you're doing all this, and of course, match your center of pressure to your center of gravity, as per my previous videos. Just one final bit of discussion is about the moment of inertia of the car. When turning into a corner, you end up with an angular acceleration, okay? You're not having any rotational velocity, and then you want to have a rotational velocity, and then it's steady for the corner. I discussed this in some of my Ackman videos and stuff like that. Now, this acceleration is defined by alpha equals T on I. Now the T stands for our torque, uh, which is more or less our turning force into the corner provided by steering the front wheels while the rear wheels are at zero angle. Our alpha is our angular acceleration of the car into the corner or out of the corner at corner exit. And I is the moment of inertia of the car. And this is the interesting one. Now this moment of inertia is defined uh, more or less by the mass of each component uh, times the distance from center of gravity to the component squared. So as we start to move away, we rapidly increase our moment of inertia. And this is why you need mass centralization. And in some cases, you can actually significantly reduce the moment of inertia with a front wheel drive setup because you can mass centralize your engine gearbox, things like that. 
and end up with everything clumped nice and tightly. But of course, it's gonna vary circumstance to circumstance. But the key thing I want you to take away from that is, is that a front heavy car doesn't necessarily mean you end up with a poor moment of inertia, but often things like older front wheel drive and all wheel drive Audis, which had the engine wholly in front of the front axle, had very poor moment of inertia because the center of gravity was here and you've got an engine out here, big distance, big object, poor moment of inertia. The other reason that a nose heavy car can cause turn in understeer is that it reduces the distance between the center of gravity and the force from the front wheels. And while moving the center of gravity forwards does increase the magnitude of the grip force on the front wheels, it does so at a lesser rate than the decrease of the distance. You can see this by the fact that if the center of gravity was directly on the axle line of the front axle, that there would be no distance between the center of gravity and the front wheels, and as such, no torque could be generated around the center of gravity by the front axles. Thanks for watching. I know I didn't give you a specific value on what the optimal weight distribution is, because it more or less isn't one, but hopefully you still found this video informative and were able to glean a few interesting facts about weight distribution for front wheel drive cars from it. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment below on what you want to see next from me. Subscribe to my channel for more and hopefully I'll see you next time.